the top one though of all of them by far that has an incredibly strong safety profile. It is a cheap, it is a simple form to get, has a important magnitude of effect and is uh, effective across multiple domains of physical health and performance. And it is because of that, it is my crown jewel. It is, in my opinion, without question, the Michael Jordan of all supplementation. Uh, what I'd love to know though is if we could define some of these modifiable variables yep. in the context of strength. So let's say I were, oh, okay. some, yes, I were somebody who yeah. I come to you and I say, um, me and my sister both want to get stronger. Yep. What modifiable variables should, um, okay. how should we modify the variables? Love it. All right, great. The very first thing I'm going to go through is the, the exercise selection. So let's choose an exercise which ideally has a full range of motion or close to it that doesn't induce injury for you, that you can still maintain good neck and low back and, and position and everything else. Um, you feel comfortable and you want to kind of balance between the movement areas. So this is an upper body press. So this is pushing away from you, bench press, things like that. Upper body pull, pulling an implement toward you, uh, bent row, pull up. Um, the pressing should be horizontal, so perpendicular to your body, as well as vertical. So this is lifting a weight over top of your head, lifting a weight away from you. The pull version is pulling horizontally to you and pulling vertically down, pull up, things like that. Um, so but, I, yeah. but I realize that the importance, I like this idea of, of pushing um, uh, perpendicular to the body overhead, pulling both toward, uh, toward the body and from overhead. That just makes really good intuitive sense, especially since a lot of people were just listening to this and not watching it. So yeah, yeah. In, in your minds, folks, you can think about um, pushing away like a punch or overhead, um, like lifting something overhead and then pulling toward uh, your midline or toward your body rather, and then pulling yourself up like a pull-up in a PE class for those of yeah. you. So if you were going to do a single workout, you could choose four exercises and you could choose one of each. One press, upper body press, one upper body pull, one lower body hinge, one lower body press. And, and that would be like a decently well-rounded exercise. Um, the next one is intensity. So if you want to develop strength, there is a certain recruitment threshold needed for neurons to fire. And we have muscle fibers in what we call fast twitch muscle fibers and slow twitch muscle fibers. And in general, you're going to activate the slow twitch ones first because they tend to be associated with low threshold motor neurons. It's not exactly that way, but it's, it's close mm -hmm. enough, right? Well, the only way that you activate some of these higher threshold neurons is to demand the muscle to produce more force. And it's fairly specific to force, right? It's not something you can do over an endurance thing, right? Unless it gets really extreme and fatigue happens. Um, the only way to develop strength is then to challenge the muscle to produce more total force. It's, it's not the volume, right? It's the intensity. So in order to maintain that, we have to do a low repetition range. But in addition, we also have to have a high rest interval because if we start to, if we have any amount of fatigue incur and we have to then either reduce the reps or reduce the intensity, we've lost the primary driver. We've lost that main signal. So the number we're going to throw out typically is like two to four minutes. So all these things are, it's not about good or bad or right or wrong. It's always about what advantage do you want and what disadvantage. If you want to know the ones that are going to generally give you the most physiological adaptations across the most categories, you're almost always looking for hypertrophy type of training. And then this anaerobic conditioning piece that we'll get into, that's going to hit the most systems at once. That's great to know. And we should definitely uh, go a little bit deeper on those types of uh, what the modifiable variables are for those categories. Because I think that I'm guessing the vast majority of people want to be a bit stronger, maybe add some, a little bit of muscle or more, um, get, make sure their heart is healthy and uh, et cetera. Um, so training frequency is, is crucial, but how often can, can and should one train a muscle? And how do you know if a muscle is recovered locally? And how do you know if your nervous system is recovered systemically? Okay, this is a bunch of really interesting questions. I'm not sure exactly what route you want to go, so I'll start here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, soreness is not a good barometer of exercise quality because some types of training are going to induce more soreness and some are going to induce less. That's important to this conversation because when you ask about how do you know if a muscle is ready to train again, one of the questions is, well, what are you training for? If you're training for hypertrophy, right, muscle size, muscle growth, we need to hedge towards recovery because what you're trying to do is cause a massive insult there, allow then protein synthesis to occur, building of new tissue, which takes time, 48 to 72 hours, like kind of at a minimum, that process needs to occur. If you're doing actually more strength, and this is a differentiation between hypertrophy and strength, 
then you didn't induce actually much damage. In fact, you're generally not going to get very sore from true strength training, very little. The primary driver of hypertrophy is not the same primary driver of strength. Strength is not gonna cause a lot of soreness. Therefore, intensity is the driver. Therefore, frequency can be as high as you want. So you can train every single day the same exact muscle if speed or power or strength are the primary training, training tools because you need stimulus there, skill, is, skill as well, right? Practice. Developing a new motor pattern requires a lot of repetitions, right? You don't need a tremendous amount of rest. That's not, it's not, it's not a damage thing, right? It's a repatterning issue. So strength training, in fact, if you look at, again, true strength professional athletes, they're going to train the same muscles basically every day. Wow. They're going to squat every day. I gave you the answer for strength training. The answer for hypertrophy is probably less than three out of 10 on level of soreness, you can go again. In general, you're probably looking at 72 hours is the, the optimal window. So if you trained your, your shoulders on Monday, you probably would not want to train them again on Tuesday. If hypertrophy is the goal, maybe Wednesday, maybe Thursday's best. So something like an every two to three day window is, is probably, um, and we know a little bit more now about why that is, but the protein synthesis process is 24 to 48 hour thing. And so it tends to kind of look like let that thing finish and let that signal go back to baseline and then hit it again and then hit it again. And now as long as you're providing the nutrients, the recovery should happen and you should be able to sustain the same work output in the training session. So the stimulus stays high and the recovery's there and you can now continue to grow muscle. For hypertrophy, sure. what are the repetition ranges that are effective and what are the ones that are most effective if one is trying to maximize some of the other variables? Like people don't want to spend more than Got an it. hour to 75 Realistic. minutes in the gym. Right. Um, the quick answer there is anywhere between like five to 30 reps per set. That's going to show across the literature pretty much equal hypertrophy gains. Um, and we could have a really interesting discussion about why that is. But when it comes to hypertrophy training, the way I like to explain it is it's kind of idiot proof. The programming is idiot proof. The work is hard though. So here's your range. Anywhere between, you know, five reps and 30. Like, can you hit somewhere in there? Perfect. It's all equally effective. You can't screw that up. The only caveat for hypertrophy is you have to take it to muscular failure. And you need enough rest for the adaptation and protein synthesis to occur. Yep. Yeah. Right. And if you recover faster, you can maybe do it more frequently. And if you don't, maybe less frequently. Mm. By that logic, should people perhaps experiment and figure out what repetition range allows them to recover um, in concert with the training frequency that they can do consistently? My recommendation is I think you should actually set your, uh, use the repetition range as a way to have some variation because most people don't want to go in the gym and do three sets of 10. They're going to get very bored very quickly. And so I, I think you should actually intentionally change the rep schemes for simple sake of having more fun. As it relates to weight training, yeah. is there a uh, prescriptive for how to breathe during resistance training? Here I'm thinking with weights, uh, it. not yeah. necessarily body weight only movements, although I suppose it could be, mm -hmm. that applies 75% of the time to 75% yep. of the people. What I was taught, and I'm hoping you're going to tell me this was wrong because then there might be more benefits that awaiting me, um, is that I should exhale on the effort and inhale on the lesser effort portion of an exercise. Is that true? Is there a better way to breathe? There is a better way to think about it. So, Number one, if you can breathe and brace, then this conversation goes away. So if you can main, remain, uh, you can maintain intramuscular, intra-abdominal pressure while breathing, then I don't really care when you breathe. Very challenging to do at very heavy weights. If we flag this on two areas of a paradigm, paradigm one over here, you're going to do a set of 30. And you're going to do front squats where a barbell is sitting on your throat. If you don't take a breath, like, this is going to end one way and one way only, you passing out. Clearly has to be some breathing strategy. The other end of the spectrum is, let's say you're going to do a vertical jump. You don't need any amount of breath there. It's never going to happen, right? The question is, what about in the middle, right? So I'm doing some sort of strength training there. Well, number one, make sure you're braced and then you can get away with less need to worry about it. Um, in general, a, a decent strategy is to maintain a breath hold during the lowering or eccentric or most dangerous part of the movement. And then you can exhale on the concentric portion. So if the bench press is our example, if you held in, braced, lowered it under control, 
and now started the concentric pushing away force, and then you wanted to take an expiration whew, during the last half of the concentric portion, that's, that's an okay strategy. If you're going to do a single rep, you don't need to worry about it. You, you can just avoid or omit breathing entirely. You're going to be just fine. If you're doing more than that, especially three to four to five to seven, eight, you're going to have to have some breathing strategy. A very common one is um, probably every third breath. I'm going to do like, <gasps> exhale on the third, reset, rebreathe, something like that. If you feel like you need to breathe after every one, that's okay, but it's going to get wasteful because you have to take time in between reps of sitting there. If it's a squat, that's different. Um, versus a deadlift if you're resting at the bottom. So there, there is a little bit of game here. So in general, though, is, is that 75, 75 kind of rule you thrown out, you threw out. Breathe in, do the lowering, and exhale on the out if you have to. Less reps, don't worry about it. More reps, then you need to come up with some sort of breathing strategy. When I think health and aesthetics, I think, okay, the ability to do sustained endurance, 30 plus minutes of some ongoing activity, how does one maximize that work? Uh, what are the modifiable variables? And then maybe you could tell us what the uh, the other major category is yep. that people ought to have in their um, kit. As soon as we cross into the endurance world, and this is true for all four of those categories, exercise choice needs to be very concerned with eccentric landing. So if you take something and magnify it across 30 minutes or even five minutes, but of maximal exertion, you have a recipe for blowing up. So anytime we start pressing to fatigue, Let's be very concerned with there. So my initial um, recommendation is start with activities, exercise choice-wise, that are mostly concentric-based. So think about a cycle. So when you're riding on a bike, you're pushing the pedal, but you're never landing and absorbing it. So you could go out and do a 45-minute bike ride, and you're not going to get that sore because there's not a lot of eccentric load. Um, swimming, similar thing here, right? There's some eccentrics when your hand hits the water, but fairly minimal. It's mostly a push, 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 no load. Rowing, similar thing, mostly concentric. Uh, pushing a sled is fantastic. Going uphill, running or even walking hard uphill, all good because they're very minimal landing relative to like running downhill, which would be a very, very bad idea um, to start. So when you, if you're first jumping into these things, progress your volume for endurance very slowly if it involves eccentric landing. So what to pick? Pick the one that you are most technically proficient in because you're gonna do it a lot. It's gonna be a lot of repetitions. Whatever one you feel the most joy in. If that's rowing, great. If that's pushing a sled, it doesn't really matter. What are some of the um, finer finer points on yep. long distance endurance? So I and how to... often should one do it? Okay, uh, uh, frequency you could do it is daily. Right. Even when strength, doing strength and hypertrophy. No question. Training. Well, that I think is an important point for people to hear because a lot of people think that they are going to greatly diminish their strength and hypertrophy yeah. gains, as it's often called, um, by doing in zone two cardio. Zone I, two, you have almost no ability to block your hypertrophy. Zone two, truly, if it's really within that category, if you're talking about conversational pace, um, there is very, in fact, there's strong reason to think that is not going to influence hypertrophy for the overwhelming majority of people. It might even help it by increasing blood flow to the various Absolutely. muscles. Absolutely. The interference effect is what this is called. So this is all the way back to 1980, famous experiment. One group did an um, endurance piece, right? The steady state cardio. One group did a strength training piece. And then the third group did both of those workouts combined. Not like a reduction. So both, both volumes stacked on top of each other. And the results are fairly predictable in terms of the endurance group only had the greatest increases in VO2 max and endurance markers. The strength training group had the greatest increases in muscle hypertrophy. But where the interesting part was and where this whole field started was the combined group. So this is concurrent training is what it's generally called. So you're doing concurrent things. And typically that means hypertrophy and strength stacked on top of some steady state endurance. In the same work. Same, same, same workout. Same two hour block. Or same like week. Okay. It doesn't really, it can be Got it. kind of all these. The concurrent group saw the same improvements in VO2 max as the endurance group. And he's like, well, okay. So the strength training did not compromise the endurance adaptations. However, they saw much lower increases in strength and hypertrophy. And so it was, the conclusion was the addition of endurance work compromised muscle growth and strength development. However, the addition of strength training to your endurance work will not compromise your endurance gains. Sodium bicarb, baking yeah. soda. Um, rumor has it 
and data has it that it can actually be a pretty effective training tool. Very effective. Could you explain a little bit of about how it works and how one might explore using sodium bicarb to enhance training output in a couple of different contexts? Yeah. So there's effectively muscle contraction happens because enzymatic function occurs within a fairly specific pH range. Right. So if it gets extremely acidic, it doesn't like it. And so whether you're running through aerobic glycolysis or anaerobic or anything else, all of these things require, even ATP hydrolysis requires ATPase. An enzyme has to do. Enzymes don't function well outside of this fairly special range. So what happens is generally fatigue, the, the sensations of fatigue are actually caused by some signal that, hey, we're starting to run out of pH or we're getting in the wrong range. You're not out of gas usually. You're not too low on oxygen, you're not running low on muscle glycogen yet, you're typically going to see signs or feel signals of fatigue way prior to that, mostly being pH issues. That being said, what if we could regulate pH better? Enter bicarbonate, right? So um, whether taken as a cream or a powder or baking soda or anything else can simply put you in a more alkaline state even acutely. So this is something you can take right now before your, your workout. Um, you're going to delay what we call delay the progression of fatigue. And how would, how would people start to approach this practice? I, my understanding is you can do this with common, um, you know, store-bought baking soda. No question. When am I going to drink this um, sodium bicarb solution? What, how would I make the solution? Uh, let's say I'm, I take 10 ounces of water. Yeah. How much bicarb do I want to, sodium bicarb should I put in there? Can we come up with it? Is it half a teaspoon? Is it a teaspoon? Um, here's what I'm going to tell you. You will thank me by starting lower. You can always go more later. So a little pinch. You cannot go backwards. How about I start with a quarter teaspoon? Fine. Half, honestly, half is fine. Half a teaspoon. It's totally fine. Dissolve that. Slug yep. that down. If you, as a teaser, would you mind just listing off the other um, supplements that you have found are very effective for, for many people? So sodium bicarb or baking soda is one. What are some of the other ones? Yep. And we'll go kind of in reverse order. Beta alanine is another very classically effective one. Um, the top one, though, of all of them by far that has an incredibly strong safety profile. It has, it is a cheap, it is a simple form to get, has a important magnitude of effect and is uh, effective across multiple domains of physical health and performance. And it is, because of that, it is my crown jewel. It is, in my opinion, without question, the Michael Jordan of all supplementation. And that's creatine monohydrate. It affects so many things. We typically think about it as it's muscle, stuff, right? You've, you've talked kind of, you quickly were talking about the creatine phosphate system, but we have to realize um, the vast majority of research on creatine phosphate is not in sport performance and has not been for 20 years. It's in clinical and it has everything from effects um, on the neurological system to there have been associations to mental health and depression. 